I want to take us back to a time not so long ago. This time around 2013 to be exact. I want you to close your eyes if need be to kind of bring back that memory, that feeling that you had when you might have been sitting at my meeting or might have been sitting someplace else. Think back about what we were faced with in 2013. We had a stagnant economy, an economy that was due or in jeopardy due to spiraling debt and wasteful spending by the previous administration. We were in an economy where business confidence was at an all-time low. And this was evidence from the business community themselves. We were at a period of our time where unemployment was at an all-time high. Nearly 2,000 Caymanians were out of work at that time. We were at a time where there were many suspect deals made, some thankfully thwarted by the powers that be. We were in a time where the country was crying out for change. Every neighborhood, every walk of life, every household. And thankfully, for the first time in many decades, we managed to break the mold here in West Bay and we managed to get that change as one of our four representatives for the District of West Bay. So I want to fast forward until today. We are now in a situation where our economy is growing at a pace that is strong. We are expected, or we, are, we have a 3% growth, our GDP growth rate in 2016 was said to be 3%, which is the highest economic growth in over eight years. We are said to have the strongest economy in the Caribbean. We have a solid, sound economic plan that will produce core debt reduction of some $123 million in debt will be reduced. So our accumulated debt burden is expected to go from $574 million during the 2012-2013 year to $451 million at the end of 2016-2017 year. That is a 21% reduction in, ten, in debt in just four years. And let me just bring it home, why this is important. Because reducing the debt burden today is reducing the legacy of debt that we are leaving for our children tomorrow. Reducing the debt is reducing the shackles that we would be placing on our children if we continued to spend frivolously, wastefully, without any regard to tomorrow and future generations to come. We have also gotten to a place where employment opportunities have been created for Caymanians. In fact, over 2,000 more Caymanians have found employment as of October 2016 when compared to the same period in 2012. And I want to repeat that. Over 2,000 Caymanians have gotten jobs since 2012. While this is while the total number of Caymanians in the labor force, that is, those Caymanians that are 
of working age who are either employed or looking for work, those numbers have also increased. Yet we were still able to create an environment where over 2,000 Caymanians found jobs in this country since 2012. And so what that means is when you hear people say, well, what she did for employment, what his government did for employment, you remind them of that statistic. And that statistic didn't come from me. That statistic came from the recognized authority in the country for gathering labor statistics, and that is the Economics and Statistics Office. So when people make claims to try to sway you emotionally without any hard facts, you fall back on the default, which is data that you can hang your hat on. Keeping on the theme of employment, we heard a lot about some of the things that I did as minister, some of the initiatives that I pushed forward in education. So I want to turn my attention, and that's obviously from the speakers before me. So I want to turn my attention and, and focus and keep on the theme of employment. So you all will recall that in 2013, when I campaigned, I campaigned heavily on the need to fix the disconnect between the NWD, which is the agency that was established in 2012, by the way, to assist with the training and development of em and employment of Caymanians which was under the Ministry of Employment and is under the Ministry of Employment and to create that connection or that nexus with the Immigration Department and the Department and its boards who are responsible to act as the gatekeeper as it, as it is for employment in the country through the issuance or the denial of work permits. So, and that department is housed under the Ministry of Home Affairs. So the reality of the situation is we have a very complicated and very complex labor market structures. So one of the first things in campaigning and recognizing, listen, if the left arm isn't working with the right arm, we're going to have some serious problems. Because one agency is trying to help Caymanians get trained, employed, or at least it was set up to do that. But I really think that it was set up to fail. Because when I took office, the agency had virtually no staff, it had no sense of direction, and it was very manual and very inefficient. But Instead of throwing my hands up in the air and doing what other people would have done, as we heard from Laura, scrap the project because it was something that started before me, I rolled up my sleeves and said, how can we fix the situation? How can we get the agency to be able to deliver on its mandate, which is to be a facilitator of training and development and employment of our people? So one of the first things that we did was to do a complete analysis. And we didn't do this just with us. We involved the private sector, the employers, the people that we know we needed to work hand in hand with to find and get people jobs. And so by taking this sensible, pragmatic approach to change, we fast forward now to 2016. We have a system for the first time in our history where the NWDA and the Immigration Department are actually connected virtually. Meaning, there's no need for somebody from the NWDA to go to the Immigration Department or go to the boards and sit there and say, yes, they're Caymanians registered, or no, they're not. Everything now is at a click of a mouse. Everything now is real time. Everything now is logged in this system that I campaigned very, very heavily on in 2013. And I was able, working with a dedicated team of people in the ministry and working with dedicated private sector um, partners who came on board to try to help us design and develop 
the program within one year. So by 2014, this system was up and running because there was no time to waste. We were at the highest level of Caymanian unemployment in our history. And you needed people who wanted to do more than just talk about the problems every four years. So where we have a commitment to doing better, we do better. But where we only pay lip service to doing better, we get nice flowery languages, we get nice beautiful glossy manifestos, and I'm sure a lot of them manifestos are making its rounds in the landfill as we speak. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the key things, and I believe, I, can't, I think it was Alana that may have touched on it in her introduction of me, one of the key things that I felt as minister with responsibility for employment, but again, knowing that the employment structures are very complicated, I had one aspect of that to be completely within my control, and I tried to make sure I, we could fix and improve that system to the best of its ability possible. We made sure that by 2016, we now have a system where we have over 1,900 employers who are actively posting their jobs and where active job seekers can come and find out which jobs are being posted and it is averaging 240 hires per year as a result of the help of the NWDA. We also, as a government, and it's certainly something, an initiative that I led as minister, again, with responsibility for employment. We also implemented a policy, a policy with respect to concessions, any concessions that we were asked to give as a government. And sometimes you need to give concessions when you want to spur certain activities or certain development. So anytime as a government we considered, well, maybe in this instance, concessions are warranted, we now have a policy that states there must be Caymanian employment targets tied to those concessions given. Because we have a history of giving many concessions over the years. Many governments have given concessions. And like I said, I'm not here to say that concessions aren't necessary. But if we give concessions without any expectations of getting anything back in return for our people, then we have the right to ask the question, who are we developing for? So what we did, and here is a real life example because you all probably know me by now. I don't say things that I can't back up. So here is a real life example of how this policy has actually borne fruit and we have increased employment opportunities for our people in areas that didn't exist before. So there is a company on island that does very spe specific IT related work. This company has a partnership that we insisted be put in place from the beginning when they were looking to come into the country with the University College of the Cayman Islands. We said, okay, we know the lion's share of your staff initially is going to have to be from overseas because we just don't have the technical expertise here on island. But we want you within a certain period of time to ensure that you reach and maintain a minimum of 25% Caymanian employment, even in this very technical field. And we want you to do so by making sure that you go to our institutions of higher learning and you find and you recruit, recruit those students who have an interest in the kind of work that you are bringing to the country who may not even be aware about this employment opportunity. And thou, those were the conditions placed on the company in order to get the concessions that were granted. 
I'm happy to say that they not only now have met that target, they have exceeded it. They have 34% Caymanian employment in an industry that did not exist four years ago here on island. And it is creating and diversifying our economy at the same time. But we did it in a way that we didn't leave our people behind. Because it's all good and well to talk about how many jobs you're going to create or how many employment opportunities can come with certain developments. But if you don't have the foresight to ensure that there are actual connections, that there are actual requirements to spur this kind of development or spur this kind of economic and employment opportunities being given to our people, then you have the situations where you go into certain establishments and you're wondering, where are the Caymanians? Because the people at the top at the time didn't have the foresight to do what we've done now. And if you continue to do what you always did, what going to happen? You're going to get what you always got. So, as a result of the action taken, some of the results that happened within the last four years, specifically within the employment and employment creating space, was as I said, we carried out a comprehensive review of the NWDA. Once that was done, I had the ammunition needed to fight for the budget in order to triple the staff complement. Hiring a training and development manager. We hear all the time about our people need more skills and our people need to be trained and our people need to be qualified. We now have an aspect of that agency that has been working tirelessly to try to create those employment training opportunities. And we also have a TVET coordinator. That is technical, vocational, education and training. You hear a lot of talk now. And again, you can hear it from now until election day, I'm sure. You can hear a lot of talk now about the need to invest more in TVET and technical studies and programs, and I absolutely agree. But guess what? That is what we have been doing. So while we have a lot of people out there that are prepared to stand up and speak up, when it comes to actually doing anything to get the job done, well, that's a different story. But that's not what you have here in front of you today, ladies and gentlemen. We have worked hard as a government, and I certainly have worked hard as your representative from the District of West Bay, soon to be representative from the District of West Bay South, to ensure that we are better off now when it comes to Caymanian employment than we were when I took office. Are we there yet? As in, is everybody that wants to be employed, employed? No. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that. Because, as Laura said, I don't tell you what I think you want to hear. I tell you the truth. We still have work to do. We still have work to do, but guess what? I am committed to doing the work. And that is the difference that you need to look for in your representative when you go to cast that one X. Only one X this time, that's right, not two, three, or four. That's a spoilt ballot. And they're making it easy this time because they got your picture even. So just look for the same picture here. I try to be consistent. Same hairstyle, same look. I think there might be a flag in the background for mine, but you know, and I look for the picture. If you're not even sure the spelling of the word, that's all right. They're making it very easy for you today, or making it very easy for you on May 24th. So what we did is we also, as I said, created a more transparent work permit application system because of this nexus between the NWD and the Immigration Department. So the Immigration Department now has the tools it needs to be able to determine who has applied for a job if they've applied for a job through the NWDA portal. There's no longer a situation where companies can throw things in file 13 and say, well, actually, no, we didn't get any applications because they can go and do a check right online. And they can also 
determine whether or not, based on the feedback from the employer about the interview or the feedback from the employee about the interview, whether or not they are in a position or should grant or should not grant a permit. So again, the system is imperfect, but it's a whole lot better than it was yesterday. And I've had employees as well as employers speak to that in their own words. And I think some of that may be on the NWDA website if you're not believing what I have to say right now. Go check for yourself. Trust, but verify. We also implemented a pilot program called the Ready to Work program. And we heard a bit about that earlier. The Ready to Work program was specifically designed to address the needs that were expressed to us through our research with employers as well as employees. And in a nutshell, that program was launched in April of last year and it's, it's a, it's a six-month program but it's a rolling start. So whenever you start the program, it's six months out from there. So from April of last year until most recently, we've been able to place 67 people in employment and of those 67, 45 have already gotten full-time employment as a result of the program. And the other people, depending on when their six months expires, would then cycle into full-time employment, hopefully, if everything goes well and they've kept up the end of the bargain and the, ha the companies are happy with them. But so far, that track record is showing that there's something about that model is working. Because these are some people that, for whatever reason, was just not catching a break. They've been out of the workforce for a long time, or they had other complications. So this program was specifically designed to not just tra treat the symptom, but in many instances, treat the cause. Because they have to actually go through counseling and some sort of introspective look as to say, well, is it really everybody else's fault? They had to go through a process where you have to look within to say, how can I do things better to help myself. And I think because of that model, we have seen the success that we have so far. And the plan is going forward to roll that out on a larger scale. And I know when we first launched the program, again, some of the critics were quick to jump, oh, the government is just paying these companies to hire these people for six months. Because again, change, we crave for it when it comes. We don't want nothing to do with it. But I'm happy to say that only 22% of the employers involved in this program has accessed any sort of funding from the government. So that goes to show that what is attractive about this program isn't so much government paying them money. It was about all of the other support that was put in place to ensure that the people were successfully are successful in finding jobs and working in partnership with the private sector. Again, that's a buzzword you're hearing a lot now, public-private partnerships. Well, I campaigned on it, but I didn't just campaign on it. I saw that it actually came into fruition and a program like Ready to Work is a prime example of that kind of partnership. We also launched, and this was another campaign promise, if you recall, we have launched what has been called the National Internship and the National Apprenticeship Programs. And what that has done, I'll give you the big picture and then I'll drill down on the individual programs in a minute. So to date, we have been able to establish roughly 10 new programs and those programs have assisted over a thousand Caymanians. And that's from school age students straight on up. Because we recognize that helping our school leavers, our soon to be school leavers, transition into that world of work or world of studies, that was an area that needed focus and attention. So some of these programs are specifically designed to do just that. Again, these are hard facts. So just to give you a quick overview, 
as to what some of these actual employment programs were. And I, and I appreciate some of you know this already because you've been keeping up with what's happening, but it's important for me to go through and detail for any of you that may be asking the question or that may be hearing the question, what she did for employment? Here we goes. So one of the first things that I did by summer of 2013, I was elected May. One of the very first programs that was designed by the end of summer 2013 was a program called the Pastoral Support Workers Program. And that program was an innovative program in that it looked to address two different issues we were facing. Lack of support in terms of people in the schools to help with some of our most challenged students but also it was an employment creation program because in order to become an, a pastoral support worker, you had to be registered with the NWD and you had to be Caymanian. So again, we were at the highest level of unemployment in our history. So you had to be creative in trying to kill two birds with one stone. And that's exactly what we did as a government and what I did and put in place as a minister with responsibility for both education and employment you get creative, you roll up your sleeves, and you deliver on your promises. Another program which we launched, and I see there are actually people in the audience here today who have participated and who continue to participate in that program, and that is the Cayman Finance Student and Work Experience Program. So when I took office, there was a glaring gap that I discovered. Again, didn't come in to rock the boat in any way. Initially, I just wanted to see what was what, get my feet wet, do my own investigative reporting, so to speak. And I discovered that our dual entry students, that is our students who were in year 12, but had gotten enough passes to go either to UCCI or to go to do their A-levels, they didn't have any work experience options. But students at SciFEC had work experience to some degree. And so, having a conversation with Cayman Finance at the time, over coffee, we decided, or the CEO, we decided, you know what? We can make this happen. And we can make this happen in six weeks because it has to happen this year. And that was 2015. Because I didn't want to talk about an idea, come up with this great, brilliant concept, and wait an entire year to put it into play. So within six weeks, staff of the Ministry of Education, came and Finance, came together, and we had a program that catered to over 50 of our dual-entry public school students, giving them opportunities that they have never had before, and that is to create relationships, create partnerships, and create work experience opportunities in the financial services industry here in the Cayman Islands. By 2016, that program had grown to 75 students. And we expanded it and opened it not just to our public school Caymanian children, but also our private school Caymanian children. And this is the third year which we've launched it. And unfortunately, I couldn't be there for the launch because certain things like campaigning is kind of taking up a little bit more of my time now. But this is the third year running. And so I suspect that we will have another successful year in making sure. To date, we've had 125 students involved. And I'm waiting to get the update in terms of the numbers of students who are involved in this year's cohort. So here is a clear example again of not just talking about a problem, but finding a solution, implementing a solution, and seeing the results of that solution taking place. We've also had a number of internships that we've put in place. We put in a training program with Prosperity Capital Management, again, a financial services company who are looking to train persons who are studying on island accounting. It's about creating that relationship between getting your academic preparation and finding jobs. And that's a key, key disconnect, not just here in Cayman, mind you. This is a problem the world over. More and more people are getting educated, 
but having a harder time actually getting employment. So Cayman is not unique in that sense, and it's important to put it in context. But that's not expect, accepting any sort of excuse to say, okay, well, because it's a global trend, we can just kick back and let it ride. No, we have put things in place to ensure that our students are getting real work experience before they finish their academic studies. And as of this year, all scholarship students are now required to register with the NWDA. You hear the cry about making sure our scholarship students somehow get connected with jobs. Well, we have put that in place where they are now registered or will be registered so we can keep a track of them. We can know when they're finished, what they're doing, what their studies are, and that information again can be fed to Immigration Department. Remember now we have that connection already in line. And that will help businesses when they're planning for their staff and recruitment, they can see in the pipeline who is coming, who is coming up and who's available for work. Because it's all fine and good talking about more needs to be done, more needs to be done, more needs to be done. But if you don't have leaders that actually are innovative, are forward thinking, are visionary enough to come up with the solutions to what this more is, then we will continue to hear more needs to be done, more needs to be done, more needs to be done. And with some of them, as is being shouted across the hall, nothing is being done at the same time, or nothing was done when opportunities, opportunities were given in the past. So why trade out something that's working for something that you know isn't? Another um, training course that came into play very, very quickly, and already we've seen results, is the bartending certification course. We know, just looking at the work permit numbers, there are lots of bartending jobs available in Cayman. So what we did through the work of the NWDA in partnership with Wine 3 School, bartending school, is we created a partnership where the government would fund the training of Caymanians to attend this school to learn within, it's a, and, and it's a short period. I mean, to become a bartender doesn't necessarily require having a master's degree in mixology. It's a 12-week course that combines academic, because now, remember now, we have some very high-end restaurants and very high-end establishments, and they're going to need you to know what wine to pair with what food and what food to pair with what aperitif and all of those fancy flowery things. So you need to have some basis for understanding pairings of wines and spirits. So we have partnered with an internationally recognized organization, the Wines and Spirit Education Trust, I believe it's called. They're offering the actual certification and the school is facilitating the internships with actual job um, employers in the country. So again, I'm all about testing something before you go full scale, right? So we started with a pilot, pro a, a pilot program that just recently ended as well. We had 10 Caymanians who were identified through the NWDA, who the government picked up the tab to fund their program, and in the end, we had seven of those who actually successfully completed not just the course, but also now have the certification. So we have removed the excuse and we have removed the barrier that may have existed previously for those individuals to say, well, we can't hire them because they don't have the experience or they don't have the training. And it's that kind of visionary leadership, the kind of leadership that you can trust that will continue to find the solutions that need to be found post May 2017. So in that note, I would ask you, as others have asked before, consider number three on your ballot, Tara Rivers, and as I said, just look for the picture. Wow, time is slipping by. So, I think I'm not going to talk too much more about the programs because I think you've got, you got a general idea. 
What I want to touch on is seemingly a hot button topic for some reason, but I think I need to deal with it head on. I started dealing with it last night, but I believe I need to make sure people really understand why we did what we did as a government and why it makes sense, no matter what kind of nonsense you're hearing out there. So that is the issue of the changes that were made to the national pensions law. I want to first start with what the definition of a pension is. Because that, if we don't get that right, if we don't understand what pensions are from the get-go, then you really won't understand the rationale for why the government did what we did to make these improvements to a dysfunctional system, a dysfunctional system that was implemented back in the 1990s. So bear in mind, it wasn't dysfunctional as a result of 2013, it was dysfunctional from the get-go if you actually have issues with the pension system as a whole. I just wanted to make sure you realize that that whole legislation didn't come into play when I took office. I inherited the system and I rolled up my sleeves instead of throwing my hands up in the air and say, well, I pretend it won't happen. I'll pretend I'll just go away my four years and do what others have done, stick their head in the sand and hope that things don't blow up. I rolled up my sleeves and I said, it's time to fix this system. So, the definition of pensions. Pensions is a regular payment made during a person's retirement. So that's the payment you get when you're retired from an investment fund to which that person and or employer has contributed during their working life. So in essence, it's what you pay now while you're working to support you when you're not working in retirement. That is pensions. However, when the legislation was introduced in the 1990s, and we, we, we've heard on many stages when that came about and who was responsible, the pension law introduced a provision that has since become very problematic for especially older people either finding or keeping employment beyond a certain age. So in 1998, the National Pensions Law introduced a concept of a retirement age. Up until that law was passed, there was no legislated retirement age in the country. 1998 was when we saw the introduction of a retirement age. And this is private sector, now I'm talking. Government is a whole different kettle of fish. Private sector pension legislation introduced the concept of retirement age. And they defined it as being age 60. So what do you think has happened since that law has been put in force in 1998 with this legislated definition of a retirement age. Any ideas? People were being pushed out of their jobs when they turn 60. Because there was a provision in law that made it clear that that was what was the expected retirement age. That didn't happen or exist prior to this new law. So all of these issues, and I saw so many of them in my office, since taking office, all of these issues of people saying, look, I'm not ready to retire. I still got a good couple of working years in me left. I got mortgage to pay. I got kids to support. I got family household obligations, but I am being told I need to leave my job when I turn 60. So that was a fundamental change that we as a government made when we made these latest changes to the pensions law. We changed the definition and we removed this definition of a retirement age and instead we have what's known as a pension entitlement age. So it's not just a change in language, folks. It's a change in structure and concept. It means now that it is an elective. You can retire when you reach a certain age. Now again, bear in mind, employment law or employment contracts 
are very much between a negotiated relationship between an employer and an employee, right? So certain employers may have policies in place, but the fact is those policies need to be agreed to up front when you're entering into any sort of employment contract. But because we had this law, this overarching law that says your retirement age is 60, that's something that people could fall back on and say, well, you know, that's the law. So when they talk about the pensions law, and when you hear them say, well, you know, some of the provisions were fair, that's definitely one of the provisions that was fair that we had to change right away. Because what that has done is that has now allowed us to signal to employers it is no longer acceptable to push people out of employment just because they've reached the age of 60. If they can still do the work, if they're still capable, if they're still competent, and if they still desire to do so, then give them the opportunity to do so. We also, again, the fact is, we are living longer, most of us, unless, God forbid, there is a tragic circumstance. We are living longer. Statistics show that we will, on average, live to about 83 years old. So if you have to retire at 60, that's 23 years of your life. And unless you've made provision for those years, that's a pretty difficult situation to be in. So that was another reason why we not only changed this concept of a retirement age, we changed the age of pension entitlement and moved it to 65. Because the fact is, you're living longer, you're able to work longer, and in many instances, you need to work longer. And so therefore, this gives you the opportunity to do that. We also dealt with this, what I think from the beginning was a controversial provision. And quite frankly, I don't even know how the provision got into the law back in 1998 to begin with. That was way before my time. But what this provision did is it basically introduced the ability for, in this case, primarily guest workers, commonly known as expats, to, in effect, convert their pensions. And again, remember, pensions are for what? Retirement. But this, this particular provision allowed, primarily, as I said, expats to convert this retirement savings or retirement fund into some sort of ordinary bank account. So what it did, it is allowed people once they left the jurisdiction for just six months, it allowed them to take the entire amount out of the fund. As I said, in effect, changing the nature, changing the purpose of what a pension is. But it was only for that select group of people, that is those people that left after six months. So what do you think was happening as a result? People left, they, you know, spent six months away, knocking on the pension administrator door, I want my money now. So they would go, and they'd take their money, and they'd spend it on whatever. Now, these are working age people now. They'd spend their money however they spend it, or they'd come back here. After that period has passed, and they're right back in the system. So what was happening, it was a revolving door of people abusing the pension system. And it was a loophole that was somehow, not a loophole, it was an actual provision that was somehow in the law, but it was causing real detriment to other pension payees, namely Caymanians, permanent residents, and anybody who has a permanent nexus to this country. We don't have that option if we're here. Because what? Pensions are for retirement. So when you hear people talk about they want to change the system back so when people leave the country for six months, they can get a check. Because we need to be humane. Who are we protecting? We need to be cognizant 
of the discrimination that that provision was causing to our own people when it comes to having to bear the burden of the cost, because it's very costly to have to keep processing these applications over and over again. Who do you think is bearing that cost when that money is gone? It's not them. It's us, right? So what the change to the law did, it didn't steal people money, as some people want you to believe. It leveled the playing field to say, listen, we're going to honor the spirit of what a pension is. We are going to ensure that if you retire in Cayman, you get your pensions. You retire overseas, you get your pensions. Either way, you get your money. And if you go overseas to a country where they have no pension scheme in place, some, you know, some of the developing world may not have that. Once you are of retirement age, you can get that lump sum because you have what? Retired. Or you have reached the age of pension entitlement. And that is what is for everyone else in this country, Caymanians, permanent residents. And when I speak about Caymanians, I'm talking Caymanians by birth, Caymanians by blood, Caymanians by status. We're all Caymanians under the law, so we're all Caymanians in this equation. So this was a problem that was ignored or maybe wasn't even recognized as a problem until we took office and we realized certain things had to change in order to bring down costs or to make sure costs were spread over the widest possible group so Caymanians weren't disenfranchised and also, as I said, honor the spirit of a pension. So, when you hear certain parties and other independent candidates, because you're riding this wave now too, when you hear certain parties talk about their first thing within their first 10 to 100 days, is to reverse this change, you need to ask them to their face, who are you protecting? Because it's certainly not you. Certainly not you, the voter. Certainly not you, the permanent person in this community. And if somebody is going to stand up and tell you that they're not looking out for your interests, if you decide to vote for that person, then guess what? You get what you get, and you take what you get when you actually don't get the representation that you need. And as I said, I want to make it very clear. The new system allows for transfers, and it allows for actual withdrawals. But it honors the spirit of what a pension is, and that is to protect or to promote you, your ability to live independently in your golden years. And very briefly, some of the other important changes that were made that actually benefit the country and our people is as I told you before, we got rid of this retirement age that was used push many people out, people that I see in this crowd, people that I know that have suffered the hardship as a result. That is no longer the case as a result of this government and this administration. We have also introduced a provision that if you are a full-time student under the age of 23, you don't have to pay pensions. Why was that important? We know that one of the highest groups of our groups that have the highest level of unemployment are our, are our young people. And so we're trying to create employment opportunities for those students who may need to get work experience because, again, tying hand in hand, we're developing many, many partnerships with the private sector to try to, and public sector to try to create these internship opportunities, paid internships as well, and paid job opportunities. Many companies found it to be very burdensome to put somebody on the pension payroll for two weeks, one month. So we said, okay, common sense. These are full-time students. 
their primary focus is getting an education, but they need to complement that with some work experience. So when they finish, they can get a better chance at getting a job. We will make that particular provision not applicable to them. And that, again, is a solution implemented to try to spur employment for our people and especially our young people. We also increased the monthly pension payout to retirees. So how long now you've been hearing, well, I can't live off of $1,000 a month for my pensions. $1,000 a month back in 1998 is very different than $1,000 a month in 2017. So that's a fair cry. But what happened was when the law again came into force, it was as if they just forgot about it. They didn't look to monitor the impact, the changes that needed to be made, and you had all of these crescendoing issues of non-compliance and issues as it relates to pensions keeping out of step. You hear now the talk about we need to do more in terms of investing the money locally as opposed to sending it overseas. All of these structures were put in place back in 1998. So if you are complaining about our pension system, you know exactly whose foot to put that system under, and it's not mine. What I am trying to do is actually find real solutions to real problems that we know exist. So what we did most recently is we have adopted a new what's called retirement savings arrangement. And the retirees in the audience will know what this means, but for the rest of us that even me had to kind of figure it out, it is the arrangement that you make to get your monthly payouts of your, again, private sector pensions we're talking. So now, instead of having a blanket $1,000 a month across the board, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how much money you have in your pensions, doesn't matter the cost of living or the inflation rate, we have changed that system to as of the beginning of this year, you now have a pension payout that matches your age, it's adjusted for inflation, and it actually increases with the amount of funds you have in the pot. So the more monies that you put aside for your retirement, the more payout you get at your retirement, and that payout actually increases year on year as you get older because we know and we recognize that you actually need more money as you get older for health care and for other costs. So instead of just hearing the cries, ignoring the cries, throwing our hands up saying, well, you know, it is what it is, we rolled up our sleeves and we found solutions. Another change that we made, again, is to do with additional voluntary contributions. So we want people to save for retirement. We want people to save while you're making money. Try to put aside something, even if it's a little bit every month. Put that extra, because you know what? You didn't really need those pair of shoes, did you? We didn't really need that handbag. I mean, well, I don't know. That, that one's kind of off limits. But you didn't, <laughs> you didn't really need to take that trip again for the second or third time. So put aside something a little extra. So those additional voluntary contributions are those that go above and beyond your actual pension payments that are required. But what we've done is we recognize that some people are afraid because if worst case scenario something happens and they have to access that money, before the change that we made, you couldn't. Whatever you put aside as your additional voluntary contributions were locked in until you retired. So it didn't actually spur people to save. So what we did is we said, okay, we have your mandatory pensions. You can't really touch that until retirement. But if you're going to actually go above and beyond and put a little bit something extra every month, you can actually access that before retirement, that portion that is in the event that you have educational needs for you or your child, dependent child, in the event that you have health care needs that are not covered by your insurance that are required, in the event that you have housing needs. If you needed that money 
to basically pay off your mortgage or if you needed that money to help in some housing situation, that money is now available. It wasn't available before. Or if you found yourself in hard times and you became unemployed and you needed that money just to live until you got back on your feet, that is now an option that didn't exist before these changes come in or came in, I should say. But of course, you don't hear them talking about that. They want to focus on how they can make sure that they continue to disenfranchise you as Caymanians and permanent residents by favoring people that are guest workers who understand clearly what pensions are because more than likely, they're coming from countries where they either pay income tax or they pay some sort of social security or they pay both. So... What we have done in trying to address the pension situation is that these issues were long neglected and it was snowballing into a nightmare. We are nowhere near where we need to be to addressing all the issues, but I can tell you, and I have just demonstrated to you, we are a lot further ahead than when I first found it. And because of that, you know that when I say work will continue to address some of these issues, and by the way, as we speak, the issue of investing and how the monies are invested, that is already being looked into, and there's draft legislation to address that. But the reason we couldn't get it is because we literally ran out of time. We just got so much going on in this ministry and this minister. So we couldn't get to it in this term, but I give a commitment to you next term. I will do all I can to see that we address that in short order. So in conclusion to pensions, and probably in conclusion to this meeting, because I don't want to abuse your generosity, I will deal with pensions alone. Follow me on the campaign trail to hear about other th exciting things such as education and whatnot. In conclusion to the pension thing, because as I said, this is now somehow taken off like wildfire because of the misinformation that's being spread. Don't be fooled by the misinformation, people. Don't be fooled by the propaganda. Don't be fooled by the false promises. But be very aware when somebody telling you, I'm not looking out for your interests, I'm looking out for somebody else's. We will continue to work for, to put in place policies, legislation, and programs to benefit our people, Caymanian people. And I use that term as inclusive as possible because we are all Caymanians under the law. Whether by birth, by blood, or by status. Once you have a right to be a Caymanian, you have a right to be a Caymanian. But... I have heard, you've heard me say this before up until last night. You also have a responsibility. Don't wear Cayman, being a Caymanian as a badge. Or don't flip it on and off when it's convenient. You are Caymanian. You have a responsibility to this country. And to see that this country continues to prosper. The reason why you came here in the first place. Because... The adage stands, united we stand, divided we will fall. And so I am offering my continued service to the people of this country, to our people, and in particular, this time around, to the constituency of West Bay South. I have visit, visited many of you so far. I've seen you in small group meetings. I've seen you individually, one-on-one. -on -one. But I have to say, and I have to ask for forgiveness up front, because I am still a sitting minister in the government, and I still have sitting ministerial responsibilities that take me to Georgetown at times, even during this campaign, whereas many of the people who are also vying for your vote they may not have those same obligations of a job. 
so they have a lot more time on their hands to come and visit you. If I have not seen you yet, I apologize. I will do my utmost best to see you before election, but I still have a country to run. And that is an obligation that I took on at your request. You remember, many of you were at that meeting down at the town hall when I was asked to become a minister and you said, absolutely. And I take my responsibility very serious. So I will try my best to see as many of you before the run up to the elections. But if you don't see me, if you've heard me, if you know me, if you've seen what I've done, and if you don't know, get a brochure, go on the website, go on the Ministry of Education website, it's all there. And if you have faith that I will continue to say what I mean, mean what I say, and do what I say, then I ask you and encourage you to vote for me on May 24th. Because under this new system too, I need to stress it, you have one vote. One. And I guess what? It only takes one, and I'm standing right here, it only takes one to make the difference that this country needs at a time that it needs it right now. And I also want to say, you know, there are a lot of nice people running, and I mean this genuinely. There's a lot of nice people running throughout the island, but there's a lot of nice people running in West Bay South. I have personal relationships with many of them. But what I need you as voters to do is to really evaluate your choices because you only have one this time. You can't say, well, I really want this one and you know, I got three or more, I'll just give them to whoever. You have one. You have one. So you need to look at all of those nice people and I think I'm one of them. And you need to say who is most capable who is most competent and who is most committed to getting the job done? And so I humbly ask that you consider me to be your best choice. Just like we've heard from Laura, we've heard from others speaking here tonight. Hi, Mom and others, we've heard from Milana, we've heard from Cap Nguyen, I ask you to not just take my word for it, take theirs too. So when you go to mark that one X, you need to make it count. Because it's not just about in the electing nice people. And it's not just about electing popular people too, because sometimes as a leader, you have to take very unpopular decisions. Because that is what you were elected to do. To lead. In the face of whatever opposition, if it is right for the people of this country, then that is your obligation as a leader. Come what may. I believe, and many of you have followed my journey, I believe I have proven to be that kind of leader. I will continue to serve you, the people of West Bay South, and this country as a whole, God's willing, come May 24th with your support. But I will not pander to you. And I want you to understand the difference. I am not here to get elected at any cost but I'm here to get elected based on the principles that I have, the principles that I've demonstrated, the work that I have done, and the commitment that I have shown to you, the people of this country, and in particular, the people of District of West Bay. So, go to the polls, mark that X, next to that picture right there, and then go about your business. And with that, I think I'm going to go about my business too. <laughs>